Martin Young and producer Peter Hill is available from bookshops. And an article on the case we've just seen will appear in the new edition of the Listener magazine, published tomorrow. Prisoner 843C75, George Beatty, is now serving a life sentence in Sochton Prison, Edinburgh. Beatty was convicted in 1973 for the murder of a young girl near Glasgow. Beatty's account of what happened that night was so fantastic that the police believed he was confessing to murder. In fact, he denied the murder and still denies it. We don't believe Beatty's strange story of the scene of the crime, but we do believe he's innocent. We've now found new forensic evidence which suggests that the girl died when Beatty was at work several miles away and that he couldn't be the murderer. Lionel Dykes QC has been studying the George Beatty case and the new evidence produced by our research. <laughs> Normally, not a lot happens in Carluk. It's a quiet little town set amid the lowlands of Lanarkshire. Once a year, there is an event, the Carluk Highland Games, when pipe bands arrive at Carluk's small railway station. They come to compete from all over the west of Scotland. Traditionally, on their way to the stadium, they take a shortcut through a glen, known locally as the Colonel's Glen. Ten years ago, those who arrived late weren't able to go that way. The body of a young girl was found stabbed to death halfway down the side of the glen near the railway embankment. The body was soon identified as Margaret McLaughlin, a pretty 23-year-old. She had lived with her family in Glenburn Terrace, just a few minutes' walk from the place where she died. She had left her house at eight minutes to eight the previous night to catch a train at the local station. Margaret was about to get married, and she was on her way to her fiancé's sister's house in Glasgow. But she never caught that train. It was July the 7th, 1973, a warm Saturday afternoon, when Margaret's body was found here, halfway down the precipitous slope of this glen. It had been raining the night before, and her clothing was wet. She lay here with her head down the slope, her hair spread out, her arms above her head, and her clothing was crumpled as if she'd been dragged down to this spot here. There were bruises on her face which suggested punches or a fall, but the cause of death was only too clear. Margaret had been stabbed 19 times by a knife whose blade was probably more than four and a half inches long. In the undergrowth around the body, there were blood spots on nettles and on the ground. Those would prove to be important evidence. Their condition would indicate whether or not it had been raining at the time the girl was stabbed. For the moment, they led the detectives back up the slope. The stabbing, it seemed, had taken place at the top of the glen. The police could see the blood spots on the leaves quite clearly, but they never found any footprint evidence, which was surprising, because whoever had maneuvered a body right down there and then clambered all the way back up, ought to have left quite an impression on the ground. When they got to the top, the police found some red fibers on a concrete post, a broken one that stood just about here. They never found out where they came from. But then they discovered something they were eventually to present as a key clue, a knife. The pathologist said that it could have caused the wounds on Margaret's body. The knife was also found by the same broken concrete post here at the top. The knife looked exactly like this one. It had been driven into the earth up to its hilt. The trail of bloodstains continued. Back in 1973, the path through Colonel's Glen and up to the railway embankment went through here. Halfway up this second slope, the grass had been flattened as if there had been a scuffle or a fight. Here in the grass, the police found one of Margaret's two rings. Margaret, you'll recall, had just got engaged. Indeed, on the night of the murder, she was on her way to her fiancé's sister's house in Glasgow. She wore an expensive engagement ring on this finger of her left hand. It was still there when the body was found. But the ring that the police found here 
was a pinky ring, which Margaret wore on the little finger of her right hand. Also around here, the police found an umbrella. It was bent and battered and in the down position. The police thought that Margaret might have used it to fight off her attacker. So it seemed that Margaret was attacked here beside the path and then stumbled or was dragged halfway down the slope of the glen where her body was found. On her, there were two clues which could have revealed her murderer. On the front of her clothes were hairs, presumably human, and there was blood under her fingernails, as if she'd scratched her attacker. This could have been vital evidence, but the details weren't released, and neither the hair nor the blood were ever matched to anyone. But further down the slope, beyond the position of the body, were two of her possessions which, logically, should have remained somewhere near the top of the glen her suitcase and her shoulder bag. The shoulder bag was found about 12 feet away from the suitcase. The contents of the bag were scattered around as if it had been thrown. The suitcase itself was undisturbed except that the catches may have been open. This case was to become an important part of the investigation. However it got to here, it had come a very long way from the top of the glen where the girl was first attacked. For some reason, the murderer brought the suitcase right down here. He couldn't have thrown it from the top, indeed not even from where the body was found, and the contents were undisturbed. The police must have puzzled over the motive for the attack. There were no signs of sexual assault. That expensive engagement ring hadn't been stolen, and there was money left in the girl's purse. The only thing that was definitely missing was a gold charm bracelet, and that was never found. So the police didn't have a lot to go on, except, of course, for the knife which they'd found at the top of the glen beside the broken concrete post. Yet when they examined that, they found no trace of blood on the knife or on the ground around it. For the moment, the police ruled it out as the murder weapon. The police naturally talked to the McLaughlin family, but they couldn't find any reason why anyone should have wanted to kill Margaret. The family were good people. There were three sisters, and they regularly went around together. On this particular night, Margaret was going to Glasgow and would normally have gone on the train with one of her sisters. But she'd been late having dinner and packing her suitcase, so her sister went on the earlier train and Margaret followed on alone. So no one knew in advance that Margaret would be leaving the house to catch the 803 train from Carluk. During the door-to-door -door inquiries, the police discovered that several people had seen her set off for the station in the rain. She'd walked along this street with her umbrella up and taken the shortcut through the alley at the top of Unitas Crescent. This shortcut took her through to the playing field and then along the path to the glen and the station itself. As the police searched for Margaret's murderer, they must have been aware of how much the girl had been admired by her neighbours. As they went from door to door, no one could suggest any reason why such a respectable girl should have been attacked. Then they found a man who said that he had been walking through the glen at the time of the attack. According to his statement, freely given, just as Margaret McLaughlin was leaving her home in Glenburn Terrace over there, he was setting off from his house halfway up Unitas Crescent. His name was George Beatty. Beatty was just 19 years old a rather simple boy whose passion was train spotting. He was, as they say in this part of Scotland, a big softy. He had no criminal record. He'd never been in trouble with the police. His family and his workmates remember him as a daydreamer, a fantasizer, but someone who basically wouldn't hurt a fly. Now he told the police that he had left home on his way to work on the night shift at about eight o'clock on the night of the murder. The police had no reason to question Beatty's story, but among the witnesses they found a young man who had seen Beatty just after he'd walked through the glen. Ian Friel was collecting football coupons. Here I was walking up this way, and George was coming out of the lane, just at the entrance there. And I, say, I just said hello to him, and George acknowledged it, you know. That was that, really. And uh, what time do you think that was? At eight o'clock. Could it have been a little bit after that, or are you pretty sure it was eight o'clock? Uh, at the most, maybe at five past eight. Not later than that? No. To begin with, the police don't seem to have treated Beatty as a particularly sinister figure.
For a start, he couldn't have known that the girl was going for the 803 train. He'd only have seen her for a few seconds as she passed by this alleyway here, and then only if he was standing at his garden gate. But on the Tuesday after the murder, two policemen asked Beatty to retrace his steps so that they could time him. George Beatty readily agreed. He walked along here and then off into the area of the Glen. Once in the Glen, he could have seen some of the coloured ribbons that had been used to cordon off specific areas where evidence had been found. The policeman took him to the top of the embankment, asking him questions. But there the experiment ended because it began to rain. The next day, Wednesday, Beatty was brought to Carluke Police Station. He was never again to leave police custody. He was questioned once more. This time, he said he remembered slipping on the path going up the embankment. He said he'd found some blood on his hands and he'd wiped it off with a tissue handkerchief from his trouser pocket. Senior detectives were brought in and the questioning intensified. Under that interrogation here at Carluke Police Station, George Beatty talked himself into a murder charge. He was actually denying the murder, but paradoxically, it was taken as a confession. Beatty said he'd walked into the Glen and been grabbed by three men. Then, as he stood there helpless, he said he'd seen three other men repeatedly stab the girl. He identified Margaret McLaughlin's umbrella. He said he'd seen it in the Glen. He also described her shoulder bag and suitcase. The detectives didn't know that Beatty had been shown the scene of the crime. Beatty said the suitcase contained blue and white trousers, a white nightgown, a small bottle or tin of hairspray, and a carrier bag. The detectives who were interviewing Beatty were in the back room, the interview room. They came forward into the front room to look at the exhibits. Everything that Beatty had mentioned was there. They'd all been at the scene of the crime, but many of them had been inside the suitcase. This convinced the police that Beatty had opened the suitcase and that Beatty was the murderer. But the most bizarre bit of Beatty's statement was yet to come. He maintained that the men had been wearing top hats with mirrors on them. They told him that if he told anyone, they'd come back and cut him up into sardines. No one believed that story. The police charged Beatty with the murder. The following day, the Thursday, at dawn, they took him down to the scene of the crime. Here, his fantastic tale continued. He showed the police the flattened ground where the first struggle had happened. He told them that the men had taken Margaret's ring from her left hand. After a little searching, he showed them where her body had been left, and he indicated where they had thrown the suitcase. The police must have found it most convincing. They'd taken the usual care not to release certain facts to the public, but here was someone who apparently knew things that only the murderer would have known. He even seemed to know about the knife. He said that the gang of six had cleaned it by shoving it into the earth by a post, exactly where the police found the knife. And yet Beatty still denied committing the murder. The police now searched Beatty's home for evidence. They were looking for red fibers because some had been found near the knife. They checked the kitchen knives. None matched the knife by the post. Nevertheless, it was produced at the trial. Beatty was examined for scratches. None were found. There was no blood on his shoes or on his clothes. But in the pocket of the jacket he'd worn throughout the evening at the police station, they found eight tissue handkerchiefs with one small spot of blood. The blood proved to be group O rhesus positive, the same as Margaret McLaughlin's. Beatty's blood was A rhesus positive. George Beatty's trial took place in the High Court of Judiciary in Glasgow on the 2nd of October, 1973. It lasted three days. The prosecution claimed that Beatty was seen leaving his home as early as 20 to 8 on the night of the murder, and not at 8 o'clock, as Beatty himself had claimed. Beatty did not give evidence. He was now denying that he had ever said anything about men in top hats with mirrors to the police. He told his lawyers that the police had made it all up. The small blood spot, it was admitted by the prosecution's expert, could have come from 43% of the population. But the coincidence that it was the same group as the girls must have convinced the jury. Beatty was found guilty on a majority verdict and sentenced to life imprisonment. Beatty's defense counsel must have been amazed by the verdict. He'd based his case on the fact that the police hadn't found any forensic evidence to link Beatty with the crime 
apart from the blood spot on the tissues, and that, he argued, couldn't be seen as proper corroboration. He simply didn't think that there was a case to answer. Those who agreed with him based their belief on four areas. One, did George Beatty have time to commit the murder? Two, why were there no traces of blood or foliage on him? Three, was there some explanation for his knowledge of the scene of the crime? Four, the story of the men with the top hats with the mirrors on them was just too crazy to be taken seriously. Where had he got it from? The evidence that Beatty might have left home earlier than he claimed made no difference whatsoever to the amount of time he'd have had to commit the murder. Margaret McLaughlin left home at about eight minutes to eight to catch the 8.03 train, so she'd have entered the Glen about five to eight. There was then a fight up here, and her body either fell or was dragged down there. The murderer certainly went down to her body, because in the end she was being dragged by her left arm. Now, the suitcase was an important clue because it had to be brought from the top of the glen here, past where the girl's body lay, and then a hundred yards or so through the nettles down to the burn. Then the murderer would have to climb all the way up here again. It was raining that night at eight o'clock, so the ground would be slippery, yet no footprint evidence was found. Well, I've just clambered up there as fast as I can. It took 41 seconds. And at this point, we're about four minutes away from the place where Ian Friel saw Beatty. So, in order to be the murderer, Beatty would have to have made that trip practically twice, fight with the girl, stab her 19 times, open the suitcase to see the contents, and then walk off in the direction of Friel. Now, he'd have had a minimum time to do that of one minute, and a maximum time of only five and a half minutes. Not only that, the undergrowth leaves a tremendous amount of debris all over you, these burrs in particular, which are very obvious. Did he look as if he had any debris on him, any foliage? No, nothing like that. Did you see any signs of blood on him? No. And how did he appear? Just snubbing himself. Wasn't or anything, you know? Beatty's alibi after seeing Friel is absolutely solid. Along his route to work, he saw at least seven people, several of whom had a good look at him. No one noticed any foliage on his clothes. No blood was ever found on his clothes. No mud from the glen was ever found on him. If he'd been scratched by Margaret's fingernails, he would probably have had the mark six days later when the police doctors examined him. But even before this, he'd been seen several times by the police. No one ever noticed any scratches. But what about Beatty's knowledge of the scene of the crime? You'll recall that of all the witnesses questioned, Beatty was the only one who'd been given a conducted tour of the Glen. When he went through it on the Tuesday night, timing his walk, there were still police ribbons on the ground. He could also have read the local papers. The body was found 20 yards from a path she used as a shortcut. The woman's body was fully clothed. She was stabbed repeatedly. Many paths leading from where the body was found are hidden. There was even a picture in the paper marking the place where Margaret had been found. When we discovered the original of that photograph, we noticed one other interesting detail. It was taken on the Sunday, the day after the body was found yet there are no policemen visible guarding the north side of the Glen. From that side, almost anyone in Car Luke could have looked down on the scene of the crime, the area where the struggle took place, on down to the burn where the suitcase was left, and even where the body was found. George was an impressionable boy. He could easily have drunk in the local gossip about the scene of the crime, and just as easily he could have assimilated the kind of mistakes that such gossip is famous for. Mistakes he wouldn't have made if he had been the murderer. For instance, he said that the gang of six had taken a ring from Margaret's finger. Now, naturally, the housing estate round here believed that her expensive engagement ring had been stolen. George agreed. The ring, he said, had come from this finger of the left hand. But the ring that had fallen to the ground here was a pinky ring, which had come from this finger of the right hand. 
had Beatty been the murderer, he'd have known something that still isn't known. What had happened to the gold bracelet? Beatty couldn't say. He did say, though, that he'd seen the men throw something gold down there towards the burn. The police searched the area thoroughly, but found nothing. One of the most telling mistakes that Beatty made in his description of the scene of the crime was about the knife. He said that the knife found by the post here was the murder weapon. In fact, the police eliminated it on the first day. They found no traces of blood on it. More than that, one of the leading detectives in the inquiry admitted to us that they had never found the murder weapon. But we took the evidence further to one of the leading pathologists in the world, Professor James Cameron of the London Hospital. Do you think that knife could have been the murder weapon? I would think it highly unlikely. I think that uh, the murder weapon uh, has yet to be found from the evidence that I have read. Nonetheless, Beatty knew what was in Margaret's suitcase. He'd mentioned carrier bags, a nightgown, hairspray and trousers. How could he possibly have known? The only people who knew the details were Margaret's family and the police. In 1973, Carluk Police Station was just two main rooms. The front room on the left in this diagram and the interview room, known as the back room, on the right. Beatty was brought here on the Wednesday evening. He was left in the front room. Also in that room, waiting to go to the forensic laboratories, were the items from the suitcase. Once again, Beatty's statement only serves to show his ignorance of the crime. Take a look at the suitcase and what he said about the contents. He didn't know, for instance, whether this little bottle was a tin, a jar, or a bottle. The murderer would have known. Beatty did know about the blue and the white trousers, but the murderer wouldn't have known about the white trousers because they were neatly packed up inside a carrier bag inside the suitcase. But if George Beatty was really keen for the notoriety of being involved in Margaret's murder, then he made one overriding mistake. Like everyone else, he assumed that because she hadn't caught the 8.03 train, she'd been killed around 8 o'clock, the only time that he could have killed her. But the scientific facts say something quite different. On the night of the murder, when Margaret walked along the path into the glen, it was raining, yet her umbrella was found in the down position. And the blood stains on the leaves in the glen showed none of the usual signs that rain had fallen on them. The evidence presented in court showed that the rain did not stop in Carluke that night until about ten past eight, after Beatty had seen the witness Ian Friel. But the most convincing evidence that Margaret McLaughlin did not die at eight o'clock that night came from the two pathologists who investigated the case on behalf of the Scottish Procurator Fiscal. Doctors Weir and Maclay are eminent pathologists. They made it clear to the police that estimation of time of death from body temperature was difficult because of the weather conditions in Carluk at the time. But when they made their report, they didn't know that Margaret had eaten a meal at quarter to seven that night. During the post-mortem, they must have examined the stomach of the dead girl. One of the wounds was there. But they made no record of stomach contents. We've spoken to both the doctors. Neither of them remembers any stomach contents at all. There is no note of contents. We've also spoken to Margaret's sister, who had dinner with her that night. She confirms that it was the main meal of the day, a substantial dinner. We put the whole of the evidence to Professor Cameron. Well, I think that, first of all, I've got to say that uh, estimation of time of death, even at the, if one were visiting the scene, uh, is extremely difficult, and doing it in retrospect is even harder. Uh, but working on uh, Dr. Weir's interpretation, uh, who uh, appears to be the more accurate, uh, I would have thought that his uh, estimate, centering around 8 o'clock, is probably the more accurate. But in view of the various changes in the uh, ambient surroundings of the body, particularly with rain, the humidity, the temperatures and so on, the varying temperatures, uh, possibly one would, uh, in retrospect, uh, give a wider margin, uh, possibly even to midnight. But uh, again, I, I must say that e estimating time of death is an extremely hazardous uh, procedure. Now, in this case, we know that uh, from the sister of the dead girl that she had a substantial meal at about quarter to seven that night. 
If she had been killed at eight, what would you expect to have found in the stomach? I would have anticipated identifiable uh, food, uh, uh, clearly identifiable food. If there were no stomach contents, would, it would suggest uh, that a longer time elapsed between uh, the ingestion of the food and uh, the death. Would that then be consistent with a death, say, at 10 o'clock or as late as, as midnight, as you suggested, could be the case in terms of body temperature? If there were no stomach contents identifiable or no stomach contents at all, I would have suggested it would be near midnight. We also asked Professor Cameron about the corroborative evidence of the blood spot on the tissues. Now, as you know, two spots of blood were found on some tissues belonging to uh, the man convicted. Uh, they were of O. rhesus positive, the same as the girl who died. And that yes. was regarded as incriminating evidence against him. The figure given for O. rhesus positive was 43% of the population in that area. Uh, does that accord with your own findings? Well, uh, look, when you work from the tables from the distribution of blood groups in the United Kingdom, uh, which was published in 1970, uh, it would suggest that uh, in the, uh, areas adjacent uh, to Kaluk, uh, the a average um, percentage of O rhesus positive blood in the population uh, was uh, just below 60 percent, in other words something around about 58 percent. One mystery still remains in the case of George Beatty. How did he come up with the fantastic tale of the men with top hats and mirrors? The answer is simple. <laughs> The pop group Slade were the biggest selling group of 1973. Throughout the whole of June and July, their eighth hit in a row was number one in the pop charts. On Friday the 6th of July, as Margaret McLaughlin was preparing to catch the train to Glasgow and George Beatty was getting ready to go out to his night shift, Top of the Pops was playing their record on the television. Tom Sargent is working with the Justice Law Reform Group to have Beatty released and pardoned. Well, my strongest impression, having visited and explored the scene of the crime, is that there was just not sufficient time for Beatty to have committed this murder. I was also impressed by Professor Cameron's evidence about the blood spots and a very strongly expressed view that the knife which was produced in court and alleged to be the knife used uh, could not in fact have been the knife. Are you convinced personally of, of Beatty's innocence now? I just say that I can't see how he did it. We consulted Lionel Dykey's QC, one of Scotland's leading lawyers. He's been studying the Beatty case and the new evidence our research has produced. I find it rather alarming that a man could be convicted of murder on evidence which consists almost exclusively of a statement, not a confession observed, but a statement made by himself and one other tiny admittal of evidence, namely his possession of a stained tissue, stained with blood, uh, which is common to about 60% of the population. So that for that reason, I think perhaps it would be in the public interest if an inquiry of some kind were, were now ordered, if only to ease uh, any possible public disquiet and to satisfy the public uh, that in Scotland at all events the legal system is indeed a handmaiden of justice. Ten years ago in this glen someone murdered Margaret McLaughlin. Someone did all the things that George Beatty was accused of, but could not have done in the time available. But his knowledge about the scene of the crime and the suitcase landed him in prison. No one we met in Car Luke believes that George Beatty, that simple boy, could have murdered Margaret. But Beatty's crazy story allowed the real murderer to get away with it. Beatty always denied killing the girl. The corroboration offered at his trial seems even less convincing now and two factors demonstrate his innocence. Firstly, the mistakes in his statement show that he was in fact just peddling local gossip. 
Secondly, the fact that Margaret McLaughlin had a substantial meal that night means that she probably died long after Beatty had walked through the glen. Yet, here he stays in Sockton Prison, Edinburgh, serving life for a crime he almost certainly did not commit. Thank you.